What's up, AFL Fantasy Freak fam? Welcome back to the channel. If you're new around here, I'm Jacob, aka the AFL Fantasy Freak. If you enjoy AFL Fantasy content, make sure to smash the subscribe button. In this video, guys, earlier in the week, I posted on Twitter asking for a bunch of questions. And in this video, I'm going to answer those questions. So without further ado, let's jump straight into the video. So I'm going to try and make these a regular thing, guys. For those of you that don't know, I always go live on Facebook a couple of times during the week and answer as many questions as I can. But I also want to give some guys on Twitter some love. So for those of you that don't follow me, it's at AFL Fantasy Freak. So the first question we have is from William. He's asking, is Bergman a serviceable D6 in order to get... Clark and Paul Hunter to Grundy and McRae and Swingberg back. So I think this is fine. Bergman, he's going to be a great rookie. He's going to generate the most cash this week. With Houston and Hartlett unlikely to play, I think he'll hold his spot. But you just need to be a little bit wary. He does have the last game of the round, so Port could potentially omit him, which could leave you in some trouble. I don't think this will be the case, but you should still have a backup plan. Clark is a failed mid-pricer that needs to go, and Hunter realistically probably isn't going to play much games, if any at all, from this point. Grundy's a must-have, and if that's how you can make that move work, then I think that's a fantastic trade. The next question we have is from Sahal. He's asking, how important is it to get to Max? I have Flynn slash Make currently. Is playing the break even a consideration with Nank and Darcy? So I think the answer to this question is quite simple, Sahal. I think you need to be getting to Max. I'm assuming you already have Grundy. And if you can't get to Max, I think O'Brien's the next best option. I wouldn't be fluffing around in the rucks at all. Darcy looks like a decent option. Nank I would stay away from, but realistically, both of those are just stepping stones and the ruck's not really an area where you want to mess around. So I'd be getting to Max Gorn as quick as possible. And if you can't do that this week, I'd potentially just play Flynn on the field and try and do it as quick as possible. But if you do want that ruck stability and you can't afford Max, I think O'Brien's also a decent option. We also have Sahal asking another question, and he's asking if Zabel is the real deal or do we stay away? I think Zabel is definitely an option. He's proven that in his new role, he has a fantastic ability to hit high ceilings. He's gone high 130s, 140s on multiple occasions, and he's taking pretty much all the kick-ins. And playing for North, he gets a lot of those a game. The ball spends a lot of time in defense and he's that main distributor. He's always there for the switch kick. And so I think even at the price now, 735K, he's definitely one that you can consider to bring in as a unique premium option. I think in the forward line, there's not too much value around at the moment in terms of premium forwards. There's not too many that are right for the picking, but Zebul, he's priced just over 100, so he's, he's arguably getting fully priced, but he's averaging 109 so far this year. I still think he's an option, and because he's got that defender dual position status as well now, he provides that extra value there. So I don't mind the look of Zebul, and he's one that I would probably consider as a premium forward option. Moving on to the next question, we have Joel Proctor. He's asking, is holding Dugowie a play? Now, he's also got Dow and Clark to deal with this week. I think you can hold him. Personally, I would be getting rid of him, but the fact that you've got Dow and Clark as well, I think that it's viable to hold him this week. 
If Clark does get named, then I would be trading Dugowie. But seeing as you've got Dow and Clark, both of them likely aren't going to play. They need to go as well. And like you've expressed, Dugowie does have a decent draw. But I would maybe potentially look at getting rid of him next week regardless. Next, we have JRS FIFA. He's asking Harrison Jones to Finlay McRae and Lazaro to Farah. Doesn't make much coin, but looking at the long run, then I bench Campbell for either McRae or Farrah. So, as I've expressed in my recent trade article, which I will link in the description and have a video coming out on that, at this stage, I like the one down, one up approach. But having said that, Lazaro's going to get dropped. Harrison Jones looks like he's pretty much capped out now. And McRae and Farrah both look like they're going to be able to generate quite a lot of value in the next coming weeks. I think that doing this double move is going to essentially allow you to keep your cash generation going, and therefore I don't mind it. In terms of Campbell, it's looking like he could potentially get rested this week, so I would be benching him and choosing to play McRae on field instead. Next, we have Jack Stevens, and he's asking what DPP players I'm planning on getting in. And in what order? Look, at this stage, the only one I'm considering this week is potentially Heppel. But I do also like Fife, and I potentially have interest in Kelly as well. I think Kelly's the most interesting one, because at his current price, he probably has the most upside. But he's also playing a forward role, and in that role, he's not going to score high enough to warrant him potentially getting back to that level. So unless we see a role change there, I probably won't be getting on board Kelly anytime soon. Fife has a great run of matchups, and I don't think we've seen the best from him this year. When he strings a couple games together, I get some consistency. I think he's going to be in the midfield again with Rory Lobb back, and he should be able to dominate. I can see him averaging 100 to 105 and he's currently priced at 95. So those are probably the three for me at this stage, but I'm probably not going to chase any of them this week as there's some other targets, particularly in the midfield that I'm slightly more interested in chasing and getting on board now. Then we have Cristiano. He's asking who's more essential to get this week, Gorn, Grundy or Dunkley? In my opinion, I don't think Dunkley is the option out of these three, and you better up tossing between Gorn and Grundy. If I was to go one of those two, I would probably go with Grundy, as I think he will average higher than Gorn this year, and he's also a little bit cheaper as well. So that's where I would be going in terms of who I would be chasing first out of those three. Next up, we have Matthew Ivey. And he's asking about going Ollie Wines to Trelaw and then Switkowski to Cozzy Pickett. He's asking if I would recommend different individuals in this trade. So my opinion here, Matt, is that I'm not a big fan of this move at all. Uh, the first part of the trade in Wines to Trelaw, I don't like this move. It's too much of a sideways move. Wines is still going okay at this stage, and I don't think there's any reason to be trading him. There's players out there that are way higher priority, and you should be looking to move on before sideways-ing a premium like him. The next bloke is Switkowski, and I would 100% recommend getting rid of him, but Cozzy Pickett is a mid-pricer who's unlikely to score well and consistently going forward, and he's not a guy that I'd be looking at at all. So in terms of what I would do here and recommending individuals, I'd be keeping wines for starters. I'd be looking to downgrade a fattened cash cow, someone like a Braden Campbell, James Jordan type, and then I'd be using that money to put on top of Switkowski and potentially going to a primo. I don't think that chasing mid-prices is a great move at this stage, 
and you should be trying to get to an underpriced premium player. Next, we've got Brady Beer. I just want to give a quick shout out to Brady because he was one of my first followers on Twitter. Mad respect to him. He comments on all my posts and um, he's great in the fantasy community. So good on you, Brady. And um, in terms of your question, thoughts on Dyson Heppel. Look, I like the move. I think that, uh, as I was just saying, you shouldn't be chasing mid-price players, but I look at Heppel more as an underpriced premium. I think if we look at his past numbers, he's always been 95 to 105. Um, and I expect that if he gets some consistency this year, he's surely going to be 90 plus. Um, and he's priced at 81 currently. So there's upside there for sure. The factors you have to weigh up are that if he does average 90 plus, he's not really going to be a top six defender. So he really has to get to that 95 plus to be worth it. And he's also had a pretty poor injury history of late and he's already missed the two games this year. So he could be unreliable from an injury perspective, but I think that at his current price, he's certainly capable of putting out scores closer to some of these other premiums that are 650 to 700k in his zone. And therefore, I think that he's still an option and one that you can definitely consider. Next, we have JD. He has a couple hundred K in the bank and he's asking if I'd rather move on Phillips or Stephenson to get Mitchell, Trelaw, Neil. Look, I think Mitchell, Trelaw and Neil are all great options. They're all guys that I, in my trade article, discussed as being heavy targets this week as midfield premiums. But at the same time, I wouldn't be getting rid of Stevenson and I probably wouldn't be getting rid of Phillips either. Phillips has proven to be a underperformer and probably a poor pick, but I think that the right play is to hold on to him. He's still capable of scoring 80 to 90, and there's a lot of rookies that people are fielding that are only scoring 40 to 50, such as Braden Campbell. So I think that fixing up the rookies is a bigger priority, and you're probably going to get more points on field that way. So... I'd probably reassess your trades and I'd be looking to do something a little bit different and keeping both Stevenson and Phillips. If you're set on those moves and you want to go ahead, then I'd be going Phillips out before Stevenson. Stevenson looks to be playing quite well on the wing and his recent scores indicate that he should be able to continue scoring 85 from this point onwards. So Phillips, I would be trading out first. JD's also asked a second question, being would you hold on to Highmore or sell him for someone like Mansell? I think that's just a wait and see proposition. Highmore, I think, will come back soon. His break-even's low, his scoring ability is pretty decent. So when he does come back, he will generate some coin. That could potentially be this week, I'm not sure. But I think that he's someone that you want to get out eventually. If he doesn't come back this week, then you can probably look at doing that next week. But Mansell, on the flip side, is probably not a rookie that I'd be chasing. As a Richmond rookie, his job security is not that great, and he hasn't shown that good of signs. He was a lot better last week than he was in his first game, but I still don't think he's really that great of a defensive cash cow option. So I think I'd rather just hold on to Highmore. If you could get Highmore to another defender such as Bergman or potentially Stocker if he gets named this week, there's a couple options that could be coming in and if you're happy with the rest of your side, it's something you could look at doing, but I don't think it's essential. You can probably just hold on to him this week. All right, so we've got last two questions here. We have uh, Darren. And he's asking my thoughts on Shy Bolton and Ben Cunnington. So we'll start off with Shy Bolton. I actually don't mind this pick. I think that he's definitely value. He moved back into the midfield with Prestia going out of the side. And with Prestia being out for a while now, I think that Bolton, if he continues to get those high CBAs, he's shown that he can score 90 plus. 
He had a big score of 107 on the weekend, and I expect that going forward, his scoring should be decent. He's priced pretty cheaply at the moment. So, and as a forward where there's not particularly many great options presenting themselves at their current price, he's one that I'd be willing to chase potentially. As for Ben Cunnington, look, Cunners has always been an 80 to 90 player. He looked fantastic on the weekend, but he's not going to be a top mid and he's just another stepping stone really. He's going to get opposition attention. He's their number one midfielder and he doesn't have that ceiling. So I wouldn't be chasing a Ben Cunnington at this stage. My last question we have from Matthew Ivey again, and he's asking, who would I be targeting if I had a spare 700 to 800k um, in the midfield? So I think the three main targets for me are Trelaw, Neil, and Tom Mitchell. I think they're all as cheap as they're going to get, and they're all great options. They're all guys that you'd want in your side come the end of the year. And being that they're not going to get any cheaper, now's the time that you want to get on board and capitalise on that. So there you have it, guys. That's this week's Twitter time. As I expressed earlier in the video, if you want to get involved and support the channel, I'll be posting on Twitter asking for questions potentially each week to do one of these videos. If you want to get on board, have your question answered, get a shout out like some of the other guys in this video, then make sure to follow me at AFL Fantasy Freak on Twitter. I hope you guys have enjoyed this content. Make sure to give this video a like, smash the subscribe button if you want more AFL Fantasy videos. And until next time, guys, keep climbing up the ranks. Look. I'm about my pledge, bitch. I'm decked up on blue bills, and I won't stop until the cash pit looks like fall leaves in the bag fill. Tell her out of my face if she coming with that bullshit. Quit to save my peace. I'm so after school special.